Good morning, Bokotov, everyone. Welcome to Mosaic. This is teaching number 73 in our course and series of Mosaic. Also, many uh, individuals and even small groups actually follow Mosaic uh, online and from afar. And so because of that, I probably feel the need to explain why for the last three weeks you've seen me in the exact same outfit. Um, and that is because here in the Detroit area, the Detroit Lions are on a run. And so when they played their very first home playoff game in quite a while, the pastors thought it would be a little bit fun to wear a Lions uh, shirt underneath our suit coats and so forth. Well, they won. So then we were told we had to do that again. And they won again. So we were told you got to do that again. And to answer your question, no, they have not been washed yet. In fact, this morning I saw maybe a little bit of last week's lunch over there uh, and had to clean that up. But uh, Lions and 49ers this evening. So for those uh, that tune in virtually from all over the place, uh, that's why you've seen me in the same Lions t-shirt for three weeks in a row. All right, so with that, let's uh, bow our heads for prayer. Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we would so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, so that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we would embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given to us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In Mosaic, we value our Bibles, put a priority on our Bibles. You are encouraged when you come to Mosaic to bring your Bible with you so that you can encounter Jesus in his fullness. But if you need a Bible, that's all right. Grab one in the pew or chair around you, but take your Bible, hold it up, and please repeat after me. This is my Bible. Jesus is who it says he is. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the Word of God. My mind is alert. By God's grace, my heart is receptive. The Bible is the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living Word of God. My encounter with the Bible today will transform and grow my faith. And we say together, in Jesus' name, amen. Primarily going to be in Matthew 13 today. However, we will be in the midst of that uh, referencing many of the parallel verses found in the Gospel of of Mark as well as the Gospel of Luke because in Mosaic uh, one of our stated goals is to try to cover every single word of every single verse of all four Gospels and sometimes the most efficient way to do that is when there are parallel passages that we read verses from those parallel passages uh, as well. Uh, So let's get started by looking in Matthew chapter 13. Uh, Again, the context from this is uh, last week in teaching number 72, uh, we saw where Jesus was uh, uh, kind of in a a natural-made amphitheater on the Sea of Galilee, uh, probably on the northern shore between uh, the town of Capernaum and the town of Tabcha. If you wanted to look in your back of your Bible on a map and kind of see where that cove is, pushed out a little bit on the boat so that his voice would clearly carry, and he begins to teach using parables. And in Matthew's gospel especially, that is the primary way that Jesus teaches. In fact, if we take all the words of Jesus that we have, all of his teachings, all of those red letters in our four gospels, a full one-third of them are parables. Uh, So one-third of everything we have from Jesus is in the parable form. Uh, On uh, Emmanuel's teaching page, if you want to take a deeper dive, uh, there is an entire course on parables, and so you could kind of hyperlink there during this time in Mosaic if you wanted to do a deeper exploration of parables, but we'll do some of that uh, together today. So 
Matthew chapter 13, beginning in the third verse. Let's uh, read these words together. He spoke to them at length with parables, saying, The sower went out to sow seed. As he sowed, some of the seed fell by the road, and the birds came and ate it. So again, the context, Jesus is in this natural amphitheater and he's ready to teach and now the text lets us know that he's taught at length so it's also kind of a a clue for us not everything that follows covers everything that he said uh, but is a nice a synopsis uh, a nice summary a nice sampling of what he said and what Matthew Mark and Luke thought were important for us to know from that Uh, but he begins those parables that long teaching of parables with this particular parable this is known uh, as the parable of the sower And I want to read to you now the full parable. That kind of kick-started us. But the full parable reads like this. Again, this is found in Matthew's Gospel, as well as um, the others. Behold, the sower went out, and he took a handful of seed and scattered. Some fell on the road, and the birds came and took them. Others fell on rock, but they did not take root in the soil and did not produce heads of grain. Others fell among thorns, which choked the shoots and worms ate them. And others fell upon the good soil where it produced a good crop. It yielded 60 per measure and 120 per measure. Now, when Jesus teaches in parables, usually, almost exclusively, the parables revolve around the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven and what it's like and some type of theme related to the kingdom of God. This parable is no different, but this parable kind of has as its emphasis on what the kingdom of God is like uh, by discussing discipleship. And there's going to be some strong words for us today uh, as we think about discipleship in light of this parable. Now, in Luke's version, Luke chapter 8, verse 9, we read that sometime later on that day, after the teaching was over, after the crowds had been dispersed, and Jesus was essentially with his inner circle of disciples, his closest disciples, those whom he had called probably along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, it says in Luke 8, verse 9, His disciples began questioning him as to what this parable, that is the parable of the sower, what it meant. He replies, and this is Mark's version, Mark chapter 4, verse 13, Do you not understand this parable? Then how will you understand any or all of the parables? Now there in Mark chapter 4, verse 13, Jesus is actually giving us a very important hint. He is letting us know that the correct understanding and grasping of this parable is the key that will unlock all of the parables. That's why he says in his answer, you don't understand this one? Well, if you don't get this one, you don't have a chance of getting any of the others. That is my translation of Mark 4. And so Jesus goes on to explain some of the symbolism. Again, in in Mark 4, in verse 14, he says, Hear then the parable of the sower. And he goes on to explain in some ways that Jesus himself is the sower. The sower sows the word, Mark 4, 14. The seed is the word of God, Luke 8, 11. uh, Specifically, the word of the kingdom. In other words, Jesus sows the good news of the kingdom, which is for Jesus at this point, the good news is not believe that he's died on a cross and risen for the forgiveness of your sins because he has not died on a cross yet uh, and he has not rose from the dead. And so that is not his message of good news at this point in his ministry. The good news of the kingdom of God is that it is now at hand, that this is an opportune time in all of God's work working with humanity since the time of creation, this is a time where he is especially close to his creation and that it is at hand. And even within at the Gospel of Luke, he even says that it's within you. 
Uh, it's within your grasp. And that is when we repent, when we return to God, when we shift from our ways of thinking of being self-centered and all about us and me and mine and my own, and we start looking back to God and we return to the way of God and we return to the ones that God has created us to be, then God is there to transform us. And so the opportunity of transformation is the real good news. And Jesus is proclaiming that it is right there in their midst. Uh, the four types of soil represent four types of disciples. And we're going to see uh, pretty soon where Jesus is again interacting with the culture of his time with other parables and stories that were familiar and known at his time. And he's either emphasizing the truth of those stories and parables, uh, or he's upping those stories and parables. Sometimes he's challenging them with his own version or his own tweak or twist on the parable. But nonetheless, whether he's challenging and contrasting or whether he's agreeing and reaffirming, he is in interacting with the culture and the stories of his day. Uh, and we're going to see that soil, when taught in parables by rabbis in the first century Galilee, related to the theme of discipleship. Now, the first type of disciple uh, in this parable does not really receive the message at all. It's hard ground. It doesn't find any way to dig in deep. The hardened heart is like the packed soil of a rough-grown, well-worn road. And so they don't really heed the message. They don't really absorb the message. And so there is no impetus in that individual to return to God or to turn to God. Uh, he doesn't understand the message. Like the birds eating the seed along the path, Mark 4, verse 15, Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown. Or Luke's version, Luke chapter 8, verse 12, the devil comes and takes away the word from the heart so that the individual does not believe and does not experience the salvation that that message offers. The second type of disciple is a disciple or an individual that does grasp some of the message, does hear kind of the uh, importance of it, or uh, when you read through Mark's gospel, the immediacy of it, that it's very important and that it, it's calling for a response now. And so they pick up on that and, and it's attractive to them. And so they actually receive it with some type of enthusiasm. Initially, this individual is one who's eager However, in the end, they have no depth and they have no loyalty or fidelity. And such an individual, they may resolve to repent. They may resolve to return or to turn to God. They may resolve that they're going to pursue the kingdom, that they're going to pursue the things of God, that they're going to pursue a relationship with God as given to us through His Son. But, as Mark 4 verse 16 says, they have no firm root. They have nothing to root it into. And so it's only temporary. And so anytime something comes up in their life that kind of causes discomfort or affliction or kind of tempts them a little bit, they immediately fall away. They're gung-ho until they have to make some difficult choices. Luke's version, Luke 8, verse 13 they believe for a while, but in the time of temptation, fall away. The third type of disciple or individual in the parable of the sower is describing the one who receives the message of the kingdom of God and responds, responds appropriately, responds with enthusiasm, but kind of mixes up the priorities doesn't understand that what comes with discipleship is a change in priority, a change in how you make decisions, a change in how you evaluate what is important for you and your family. And so this individual is one who intends to live a life 
pursuing God and following the things of God. They want a spiritual life. They want a a religious life. They want a life centered around God. But soon they become distracted by materialism. They become distracted by what the world around them has to offer. Mark's version, Mark 4, verse 19, the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of the world and its riches and the desire for other things choke out the word and therefore eventually become unfruitful. That is, they forget about the message, they forget about their commitments, they forget about the priority of seek first the kingdom of God, and they busy themselves in pursuit of what they think is most important in their life. And so the worries, the riches, the pleasures of this life distract and choke their resolve. So as Luke says in Luke 8, verse 14, they do not come to maturity. So this would be much like in our world today where you and your heart, by God's grace, through the working of the Holy Spirit, has awakened in you a need for a spiritual life, a need for God to be active in your life, a need for church and worship and Bible study, for those to be important priorities not only for yourself but for your family. And you believe that and you want that and you begin to pursue that and then hockey season comes for your kids or soccer season starts for your kids or football season starts for your kids and then you have to make that difficult choice of a disciple. Will our family value worship and Bible study over that? Or will that take a priority over God? Because God's going to always be there. This is only just three months of the season. It's only three months of the year. Or other things of the world begin to creep in. And so this third type of soil represents the individual who knows the truth, who is aware of the truth, desires the truth, but the world around it and the value system of the world around them chokes them out. And they succumb not to the kingdom of God, but to the kingdom of this world. I told you it was going to be tough words of discipleship. This is why people either loved Jesus or they hated his guts. There was no third row with Jesus because Jesus speaks tough words to us. And then there's that fourth type of disciple that understands the message and obeys it. And we're going to see that that theme is very prominent in this particular parable. It comes from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4. It's called the great Shema from the Hebrew word Shema. Hear, O Israel, that the Lord is our God and that the Lord is one. But that phrase, hear, O Israel, it's Shema Israel. The word Shema not only means to hear and to listen, but implicit with that is that you are following up on the hearing and the listening with action, that you are actually obeying what you have heard. And so when Jesus says things like, he who has ears to hear, let him hear, in an idiom way, in a colloquial way, from the Hebrew and the Aramaic of Jesus, he's saying, if you've heard it, then obey it and do it. Because in the Hebrew language, there is no difference in words between hear, listen, and obey. Those all get translated in your Bibles that way, but they're all coming from the same one Hebrew word, Shema. And so this fourth type hears, does, obeys. Luke 8, 15, the word, he obeys the word in an honest and good heart. He holds it fast and he bears fruit because of perseverance. In other words, part of discipleship is persevering. It's not easy. That's why we return to this axiom that we've had all throughout the Mosaic teachings. All disciples are believers. But not all believers are disciples 
because discipleship is hard. And discipleship will cost you. It will cost you something. And so many of Jesus' parables, as they are about the kingdom of God, are specifically going to be about the cost of being a disciple in that kingdom of God. But this individual bears an abundant harvest. Uh, as John the Baptist taught Matthew 3, verse 8, they keep produce in keeping with repentance. Uh, their fruit is in keeping with hearing the message and responding. The call to repentance in Jesus' parable of the sower is also alluding to a prophecy from the book of Jeremiah. As I said, everything Jesus said or taught comes from the Scriptures, specifically the Old Testament. And this particular parable is ripe with many of them. Um, from Jeremiah, this is coming from uh, Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 3 through 4. For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and to Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground and do not sow among the thorns. Circumcise yourself to the Lord and remove the foreskin of your heart. Men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem are else. My wrath will go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it. So the parable of the sower, kind of have it outlined for you on your handout with some blanks. If we want to fill that out, it's found in Matthew 13. It's found in Mark 4. It's found in Luke 8. The seed in this parable is the message of the kingdom. It's the message of repent, turn, return for the Messiah, the kingdom of Messiah, the transformation of Messiah. It is within your grasp. It is here. Not only can your life be transformed, but the whole world can be transformed. This is a very peculiar time, is what Jesus is saying in this message. This is the time to come to God. That's the seed. It's the message. It's the proclamation of that. The path, that is the disciples, those first kind of individuals, who cannot receive that message or who choose not to receive that message or who reject that message or who do not understand that message. And so it just falls on a hard, dirt road. The birds... That's Satan. But don't just think the being Satan. Uh, that kind of removes it too far from us to think, oh, there's the, the red individual with a pitchfork and a pointy tail, right? This is the adversary. So it's any adversarial voice. That's the voice of Satan. That's why Jesus can look at Peter, one of his own disciples, and say, get behind me, Satan. He's not calling Peter physically, literally, the being Satan. He's saying you're being adversarial to the ways of God. And so those birds, not just the being Satan, but that voice in your head that tells you to prioritize differently, that tells you that it's okay for the next month or so that you kind of put the things of God on the back burner because you've got more important things to take care of right now. Anything that's adversarial, that's the meaning of Satan in Hebrew, anything that's adversarial to the will of God and to that message of the good news. That's the birds that want to come and take it from you. And so tough words for us. What are the birds circulating in our life robbing us of those seeds of the kingdom and keeping them from sprouting? Are we going to shoo those birds away? Are we going to remove those birds? Are we going to put up the scarecrow in our hearts and minds to make sure that we and our families are protected from those birds and that they don't come? Or do we allow them to have free course with the seed that has been scattered. The rocky soil, that's the disciple again who begins the path, but quickly gives up under any kind of pressure. The weedy soil, that's the disciple who begins the process, buys into it, understands it, but becomes distracted 
becomes distracted by the busyness of life and the value system of the other kingdom. The good soil, that's the disciple who shamas, who obeys, who repents, who submits to the kingdom with perseverance through the trials, through the temptations, through the struggles, through the difficult choices of prioritization. The abundant crop that comes from that, that's the life, the acts of that particular disciple as they are then able to spread that to those around them. The overall meaning, only those who persevere, who have stick to itness, who will endure making hard choices, who will endure being mocked, who will endure giving up some of the things that they would really like to receive from this world, but they know is not as important. And so they persevere and endure through it. Those are the ones who receive the fruit that is the kingdom of heaven. It's interesting when you look at the parable of the sower and it gives you those four types of soil. It's not that I think we're supposed to literally take the mathematics of that and say, well, only one out of four in the end of it all persevere to bear the fruit of repentance and be authentic Jesus followers and disciples. In other words, they're no longer consumers of Jesus. What can you offer us, Jesus? What can you offer us, Jesus, where it's convenient to us, Jesus? When can you make the best times available for me to come see you, Jesus? They've moved from consumer mindset to disciple mindset, mindset being a follower. Uh, you know, that it's not that it's 25% will do that, but I do think it gives us the very important message that disciples are few and far between. They're few and far between because it's a hard road. And as we are now going to enter into these deeper teachings of Jesus in Mosaic, we're going to see that time and time again as a theme in his teachings. It's going to cost you to follow me. It's going to cost you something to follow me. It's going to be something different for each one of you. And at times, it may not be that big a deal. And other times, it might be a really big deal. But it's going to cost you something to follow Jesus. It's not going to cost you anything for the grace that gives you salvation. It's not going to cost you anything for the forgiveness of your sins. It does cost. Jesus is willing to pay that cost for you. He pays a very high price. And so it's not really true that forgiveness of sins is free. It costs. It costs God his son. But it's free for you. It is God's grace to you. But that doesn't yet make you a disciple. It brings you in. It transforms your heart. You now know truth and you now can, by God's grace, through the Holy Spirit, be equipped to respond to that truth. And everything that's needed to be in a right relationship with God, yes, it's true. It's been handled for you, free of charge, independent of you, because you could not do it. And now it's been handed to you. You have been given a gift. Discipleship says this. So what you going to do with the gift? What are you going to do with the free gift? Are you going to put it in the closet? You're going to rewrap it and give it to someone else? Are you going to, at different times, pull it out a few times a year when it's handy? What are you going to do with this gift? That is the question of discipleship. And Jesus lets us know time and time again, in no uncertain terms, that is a challenging road to make use of the free gift of God's love and grace and forgiveness given to you through his Son. Several rabbinic passages follow the same form, as I said, of comparing different types of disciples. And so I want to share one of them with you that comes from what's known as Pirkei Avot, These teachings were absolutely known at the time of Jesus. So what we're about to read together... This would have been 
something Jesus would have known and his disciples would have been known. They would have been taught this in synagogue or by other religious leaders. And so this is what Jesus is kind of piggybacking on. Because the Galilee in the first century, that is where discipleship was really honed. It was the epicenter of discipleship. The Roman Empire, what it inherited from the Greeks and its Hellenistic system, that was what we would call mentoring. In fact, mentor is a Greek word. Discipleship's not the same as mentoring. Discipleship does something different. And that thrived and thir- you know, uh, was a lot, and it flourished in the Galilee, and it was truly honed there. So I want us to read together this from what's called uh, Pirke Evoke. Let's read it. There are four types of disciples among those who sit before the sages. One is like a sponge. One is like a funnel. One is like a strainer. And one is like a sieve. The sponge soaks up everything. The funnel lets everything in one end and lets it out the other. A strainer lets the wine flow out, but keeps the sediment. A sieve lets out the bad, but keeps the fine flour. So hopefully there you can kind of see a parallel teaching of other rabbis in the first century of Galilee when Jesus was giving his parables on discipleship. In this particular parable from Pirkei Avot, the sponge is the disciple who retains both good and bad teaching. They expose themselves to a whole bunch of stuff. And they don't really follow like one teacher, one solid source. They kind of, as what my teacher said and warned me against because he knew I was such a a lover of books and a prolific reader, he's like, you can read all of that, but don't be a bumblebee. Don't go and get a little pollen from here and a little pollen from there and a little pollen from there. He said, whatever you read and whatever you study, you read it through me. And you read it through my understanding that I'm passing on to you. Then you can expose yourself to all of that. But this first type of disciple doesn't do that. They retain everything they hear and therefore they have a a mixed bag and really don't know what to do with the good and the bad teachings. The funnel... Well, that's the individual who, in the end, retains nothing. Pour into them, pour into them, pour into them, and then you look, and it's empty. The strainer, that's the disciple who retains the bad, bad teachings, and not the good teachings. And the sieve is the disciple who knows how to retain the good teaching and also release the bad teaching. The overall meaning, of course, is the best kind of disciple is a discerning one. One who has discernment. The parable of the sower and the Shema. So we've looked at this parable of the sower, but I want us to, again, connect it with the Bible of Jesus, the Bible of the apostles, what we call the Old Testament. One of the most fundamental aspects that come from the Old Testament, something that it was at the time and still is to this day, recited two times every single day. Jesus would have said this at least two times every single day of his life. The apostles would have said this two times every single day of their life. It forms the fundamental identity of what it means to be a follower of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the three first three types of soil correlate directly with it. So what I'm referring to is what's known as the Shema, which is in Hebrew the word hear. So let's read the Shema together. Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning in verse 4. Let's read it together. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. You may remember from previous teachings in Mosaic when we were in that section where Jesus was talking about righteousness and your acts of righteousness 
that we tied it into this exact same set of Scripture and that the three aspects of what a righteous act was for Jesus in the first century world, we're coming back to this because this is, this for a first century follower, this would have been as much as what, what the Apostles' Creed is to a, a liturgical Christian today. It's something you say it all the time, you were taught, it's fundamental to your faith, it's the core of what you believe. And so the path in the parable of the sower, that corresponds to our heart. And the rocky soil, that corresponds to our soil, our, our soul. And the thorns, that refers to might. So the hard soil of the path corresponding to all your heart in Deuteronomy 6. Biblical Hebrew uses the word heart the way the English speaker uses the word mind. The disciple fails to understand and the devil, as Matthew says, 13 verse 19, snatches away what has been sown in the heart. The rocky soil corresponds to with all your soul. That is, one's person and life. Biblical Hebrew uses the word soul, nephesh, to refer to a person's life, but their vitality and their persona. The disciples represented by the rocky soil receive the word with joy, but when affliction or persecution or distraction arise, that word, that message of God quickly falls away. They're not willing to sacrifice or risk life. And those thorns correspond to with all your might. The rabbis interpreted the word meodecha in Hebrew as with all your might. It also meant one's wealth, their possessions, all their stuff, everything that they have, physical, materially, spiritually, intellectually, emotionally. It's everything that they got. And the deceitfulness of the world can choke the seed that falls among the thorns. The good soil corresponds to the one who hears. Shema. And hears and obeys the words of the loving God with all their heart, with all their soul, and with all their might. As we keep looking in Matthew, after Jesus speaks this parable, again, we just spent a good 25 minutes thinking through that parable. Jesus didn't do that. He just told him the parable and went on to another parable and went on to another parable and went on to another parable. No explanation to the mass crowd. And so after Jesus gives this litany of parable after parable after parable with no explanations, we come to this scene. Let's read it together. Matthew 13, verse 10. His disciples approached him and said, why is it that you speak to them in parables? Like, why don't you speak to them the way you do us when we're kind of by the campfire late at night and it's just the 12 of us or it's just the 3 of us, it's just the 7 of us or it's just the 14 or 22 of us. You do more with us and you expand more with us, but when you are in those large settings, you just rapid fire parable after parable and you'll especially see that in Matthew's gospel the way Jesus teaching is presented here in this section of Matthew so they ask him like why why are you choosing to do that well as we discussed in last week's teaching Jesus was much in line with many of the rabbis and the Jewish sages of his day that used parables to make an abstract point clear. It's a one-room schoolhouse. If there are 783 people on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, there's a good chance they range in age from 5 years old to 80 years old. There's a good chance they range in those who can read and write and run their own businesses and are very wealthy to those who cannot read or who cannot write and who have not been educated and maybe some of the deeper thoughts and 
deeper uh, theological concepts and words would clearly do nothing. It's a one-room schoolhouse. And so the parable allows the speaker to hit all of those levels at once. Jesus is using parables for the same reason. He wants to effectively communicate what his message is, specifically what the kingdom of heaven is and what is being offered. Also, the expectations of what the kingdom of heaven is and what the expectation of those who enter it and follow him. So Jesus says this in Matthew 13, verse 11. His first response to this question, why do you speak to them in parables, is this. To you, my homies by the campfire, it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. We have here a scandal of particularity, fancy theological term. They have been chosen. And to them, these mysteries have been revealed or are being revealed. And Jesus is going to spend three and a half years investing everything he's got into them, unpacking these mysteries. And then he says, but to them, not all of that has been granted. And so they need the parable. We often understand Jesus' words sometimes, and unfortunately, and I've seen it in commentaries, to mean that he spoke in parables in order to confuse the masses in order to withhold truth from the masses while he delivered the real goods, the real teachings, the real deep mysteries of the universe only to the privileged. But that doesn't make sense in the overall picture of why Jesus came to this world. And it doesn't make sense in what he's willing, what price he's willing to pay for you and I. If it was his intention to conceal his message by speaking a code language that nobody could understand except his disciples, he actually would have been better off using apocalyptic imagery, kind of like what we find in the book of Revelation, as well as other mystics of his day. He doesn't speak cryptically. These are parables about farmers sowing seed. Right? Also teaches us, by the way, of the reckless love of God in that parable. Because notice that particular farmer in sowing his seed, the farmer who is Jesus, doesn't plant each individual seed where he has tilled it and made sure it's perfectly ripe. What does he do? He's just chunking it. And he's chunking it on gravel roads and hard roads and he's chunking it on the side of the road he's chunking it in fields he is recklessly throwing it out there so jesus was not about let me have something specially encoded that no one can get but he does contrast his inner disciples against the crowds the disciples I wouldn't say already understood because there's places in the Gospels where they clearly have not understood yet, but they're on the way and they are getting a different type of training so that they take, when Jesus then ascends to the Father, they are equipped to take the next generation. Leaders always train up leaders. That's all Jesus is doing. That's all that contrast is. Leaders train up leaders. Leaders prepare leaders so that when the leader is no longer there for whatever reason, there's still leadership. So Jesus spends the next three and a half years making sure that after his death, resurrection, and ascension, there are leaders in his movement. That's the contrast. And that's what them they aren't privy to. And so he uses parables to convey the message in an understandable way. And again, depending on where you're at and how long you've been following him and how long he or the disciples have been teaching you, you hear different things in the parable. 
Because the disciples were at a different level of the message. They had already responded to it. And like the seed planted in good soil, they had repented. They had already given up everything to follow Jesus. They were paying the price of discipleship. They knew the cost of discipleship. They were living the cost of discipleship. They grasped that message. And so they were able to receive more. Matthew 13, 12. For whoever has, to him more shall be given. And they will have even more abundance. What a promise that is. If that isn't a promise to instill you into more Bible study, I don't know what will. It's what fuels me. That the more I engage God's Word and the more God gives me through His Word, the more He's promised to give me. He's not going to give me if I'm not giving into it. But to those who have, to those who have this Word, He gives even more. And the promise never stops. The majority of those in those crowds didn't have that yet. They were like the other three types of soil. And so they stood to lose even what little they had comprehended. And so Jesus urgently tried to bring the multitudes to a place of comprehension, to a place of repentance before they lost what they had. And so in Matthew 13, verse 13, He says, Therefore, I speak to them in parables. We will conclude there for today. We'll pick it up next week uh, with an urgent mission.